All right, let's get started. I got a lot to get through and not much time. We have shh. Thank you. I love the power of a good shush. Um, we got three more lectures to get through, and I got two more class sessions uh, after this. So let's get working through this stuff. Um, I'll go through the test and review it. If there's any givebacks or any high misses, I'll go ahead and put an announcement out about that. Um, otherwise, if you have questions, either you can email me or hold them till next week, whatever you would prefer to do. Um, any questions on anything we've covered so far last week, perhaps? All right, well, uh, moving forward. So we were talking about bioavailability. What is bioavailability? Yeah, what percentage of that drug actually gets into the system here, right? One term you may uh, see occasionally is a term called bioequivalence. This is something when you see like generic drugs come out. Because remember, how long is the patent on uh, a new drug? 20 years, right? So again, they have that time. Once that 20 years is up, then generic manufacturers can come out. They have to show bioequivalence, essentially, right? So it's one of these things where they have to show that they have the same sort of release characteristics. The concentration of the drug has to be the same. And if they can show that they're within a certain uh, percentage of the actual original compound, that's when the FDA says, yes, you're approved. You can be a new generic drug there, right? So that's why most of the times, you know, when patients say, oh, well, the brand name works better for me, that's not typically true, right? Because most of the time, or all the time, these manufacturers have to show that their drug works just the same in terms of concentrations and whatnot as the original compound. The color may change, the shape may change, but they should have the same exact release characteristics. So if you ever see that, that's what we're referring to. Um, again, remember bioavailability gets affected by a ton of different things. We've covered a lot of these. Some of this is a little bit of review, but it's to get into uh, the next topic I want to talk about here. So again, we'll go through this fairly quickly. Remember your acid-base status. Remember how that changes uh, the ionization state of a drug. Remember the more ionized a drug is, what does that do to the absorption? More ionized, more charged less absorption, right? Because again, just is going to bounce off those membranes there. Uh, remember things like first pass effect. What is that? Yeah, when the liver, when it first gets absorbed to the GI tract, it's going to go through that liver tax that you're paying there. Um, how can I bypass the first pass? Give it almost any other route, right? So I can give it nasally, I can give it rectally, I can give it IV, whatever the case may be, you can get around that, okay? So that's an important consideration. I'll give you an example of that just a little bit, right? So these are all factors that are going to affect that bioavailability essentially. Remember our chart here? Again, go back and review that in terms of kind of relative bioavailabilities for the different routes. Again, IV is always going to be 100%, uh, unless otherwise stated, you know, there's really no instances where that's not really the case there. Anything else is going to be more variable. Depends entirely on the drug and the formulation and whatnot. Of course, remember, what's, anyone know what a normal serum pH is? Is it just 7? So 7.35 to 7.45. You remember 7.4? That is a normal serum pH. 7.0, which is neutral, is actually fairly acidic for us. We can't really survive that well at that, uh, that sort of pH there. Um, remember, though, by shifting that pH, again, our fluids, you know, different fluids we're producing can have wildly different pHs, right? So urine might be a pH of like 5.5 all the way up to maybe 7 or 8, right? So again, it just depends on what kind of fluid you're talking about. But by shifting that pH and the pK of the drug itself, again, you affect the ionization state, right? So, uh, and remember, every drug is going to have a pK associated with it, whether it's a weak acid or base. We've kind of covered this, and so you can remember that. Um, remember that when they are in that charged state, they tend to be more polar, right? They're charged, they're polar, they're more water or lipid soluble. Water soluble, right? That helps with dissolution of the drug itself to get actually into solution. If things don't go into solution, they tend to not get absorbed very well at all anyway. Um, so, Drugs need to be somewhat polar in order to get into solution, and then they have to be lipophilic enough to actually get across that membrane. And remember, we were talking about the ionization state tends to be uh, that equilibrium, right? So there's always going to be a balance between protonated to non-protonated. It just depends on the pH of that solution there, right? Because, again, what makes a substance more acidic? Like a solution more acidic? Yes, yeah, so, so it has a low pH, but what makes it have a low pH? It's all those protons, right? So again, that's going to affect that ratio. That's that henderson hasselbalch equation we were talking about there. I can hear myself speaking <laughs> very strange. Normally when I hear my own voices, they're in my head. Um, sometimes they come out to play. Uh, hard to say. Anyway, um, right, so we're talking about, you know, polar water. Obviously, this is what it lo looks like when things are able to get into solution, right, when they have some degree of uh, polarness to them, right? So again, a sodium here has a positive charge on it. It's going to be aligning with the negative ends of H2O, right? That oxygen there tends to have a little bit more of a negative charge on that end of it than uh, hydrogen does. Um, of course, be careful if you're a polar bear. You might actually dissolve in water, so ha-ha. 
Anyway, but remember our uh, example of using aspirin as a weak acid, right? Remember, if it gets into a more acidic solution, it's going to be more in that state where it's picking up those protons. Weak acids, when they pick up that proton, are they charged or non-charged? They are non-charged, right? So that means they're going to be much more lipid soluble. So like, for instance, aspirin sometimes gets absorbed better from the stomach than it does elsewhere because it has a much more acidic pH, right? That balance to the protonated state tends to be much higher. It's going to be in the uncharged sort of state there. Um, and again, you don't have to know the chemical symbols for aspirin or anything like that, but this is just giving that illustration there. By putting it into a solution that's more acidic, you have more protons on this end of the, of the equation. What does that do to the equation? Or does it shift it? I put a whole bunch of protons here. I shift it over to the left side, right? Just like basic chemistry we've covered, you know, you've covered in, the, in your past. So getting into the states more neutral is going to be able to absorb a little bit better. On the flip side, if you have something like pyrimethamine, which is kind of an old school drug we don't use too, too frequently, but is a good example of a weak base, it actually will then pick up one of these protons in an acidic solution, and this is going to be absorbed very well positive, right? So generally no, right? So you're going to want it to be in more of the state here where it has not picked up that proton, okay? And just illustrating the differences between that weak acid to that weak base. So and again, we've already covered most of this. You're very familiar with this. Remember the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation is saying what's that ratio between protonated to non-protonated? When the pH of a solution is equal to the pKa of that substance, what's the ratio? Remember, it's 50-50, right? So again, by shifting one way or the other, that's how we're going to get um, better absorption and better bioavailability. Remember that this is the 50-50 point there. Okay. And again, when you solve for it, you can actually make the pKa minus the pH, and that will again tell you sort of what that logarithm should be between that ratio there. Now, again, was I mean to make you calculate this on a test? No, but the concepts were important, right? To understand how we can alter this, right? How I can have a drug interaction that can alter this fairly significantly and that can lead to less absorption of something or more absorption as the case may be, right? So anyway, so um, other factors in drug elimination, right? So where are drugs mainly eliminated from? So they're metabolizing the liver. Kidneys are excretion. Where else can it be excreted from? The bile is the other big one, right? So again, uh, you're talking about hepatic Metabolism, biliary excretion, and renal excretion. Those are the three big ones, uh, how we get rid of drugs, essentially. There are other ways. You can breathe off some stuff. You can sweat off certain stuff. But it's, again, it's not really um, that clinically relevant for our purposes. But those are the big three. Okay. Um, remember, the henderson hasselbeck also applies when you're talking about uh, renal elimination. We use the aspirin example of how I can alkalinize the urine. I can increase the urine pH to something like 7.5 to 8, and that's going to put aspirin into that much more of a charged state because it, again, doesn't have enough of those protons. It'll just bounce off of those renal tubules, right? It's filtered through, can't be reabsorbed, and then just gets eliminated in the urine itself, right? Everyone still with me on that one? And again, we do that. I had to do that just the other night uh, when I was on call for the poison center, had an aspirin overdose, had to talk all the way through the urinary alkalinization process and how we're going to get the bicarb that'll increase the urine pH and increase that elimination of the drug, right? So... Um, you mentioned urine typically is going to be a little bit more on the acidic side, and yeah, that's a problem when we have something like aspirin that needs to be eliminated. Okay, again, sodium bicarb is the best way to increase that urine pH, and that's how we can get around that problem. Um, do you think we ever try to intentionally acidify the urine? I give someone like HCl and do that. Not typically, right? Because the problem is you worry about putting the patient into a metabolic acidosis, and that's generally not good for us, right? So um, typically, if anything, we're going to try to alkalinize patients more than more so than not. And again, looking at something like sodium bicarb, uh, the effect, we can also do the same thing for phenobarb, right? Phenobarb is a weak acid. Uh, phenobarbital is an older drug. It's used for seizures. We still use it for neonatal seizures pretty frequently. Um, but it will, when in that alkaline urine, it's going to be more in that charged state. It just gets eliminated that much faster. So the point I want to get to is to get into some of the math behind how we can sort of figure out whether drugs are going to be getting to therapeutic concentrations, if they're going to be super therapeutic. Let's kind of put all of these factors of pharmacokinetics together to see if we can start to kind of apply this to a clinical situation, right? So everyone get your calculators out. Everyone has a calculator, right? So everyone has a supercomputer either on, in front of them or in their pockets, right? I was just at a simulation yesterday with some students, and I was like, what's the dose of this drug? And they're like, uh, I don't know. I was like... Well, where can you find it out there? I don't know. I don't have any books with me. I was like, do you have a supercomputer in your pocket? Like, this thing in your pocket could launch uh, the original space shuttle to the moon. Like, you can look stuff up. It's okay. Um, anyway, so get your calculators out. Be ready for that. Propranolol, right? We mentioned propranolol as a beta blocker, right? It does things like lower heart rate, lowers blood pressure. Let's say we're giving a patient 160 milligrams or one tab by mouth, right? POs by mouth daily, okay? 
Now, some factors, let's look at uh, propranolol, see so what some of the pharmacokinetic factors of it are. Um, in terms of absorption, propranolol it tends to be a weak base, it is highly lipophilic, and has a pKa of about 9.4. So based off of this, do you think it has fairly good absorption in the small intestine or fairly poor absorption? Pretty good, actually. It's very good because it is lipophilic. Remember, as it gets into the small intestine, the pH typically goes up, and that's going to help to aid that absorption of that weak base, right? If it was in the stomach, do you think it would be absorbed very well? No. Generally, no, because it's going to be much more in that charred sort of state there when it picks up those protons. So the small intestine would be a better place for it to get absorbed. Now, looking at this, the first pass effect, only 25% of the drug that you gave is actually going to make it into that systemic circulation. 75% of it gets taken off just with first pass effect, Okay. That is why that you have to be considerate of dosing between IV to PO doses. So based off of this, what do you think the, um, the IV dose of propranolol I would give to a patient would be, be lower or higher than the oral dose? Lower. Why would it be lower? Yeah, if I were to give an IV dose. Because I don't have to worry about first pass, right? The bioavailability is already 100%. So, yeah, so essentially it would be like, say, one-fourth of the oral dosage, right? Because only 25% got through. So a therapeutic dose of this 160, really what got through is only 40, right? It's only 25%. Oral. Hmm? That would be an oral dose, right? So again, the issue is if you screwed it up mm -hmm. and say, well, I'm going to order this IV dose, but use the oral one, right. use that 160 and gave it IV, guess what would happen? Overdose. You, get, you overdose your patient, right? We actually had a case of that at the hospital a couple of months ago where we had um, the patient was on a medication for it affected the bones. It was uh, something they normally use for osteoporosis, but you can use it for other sort of uh, bone issues. And um, we did not have that available. It was not on our formulary, the t oral tablet that the patient was on. We had an IV form that was used in very specific sort of circumstances, but the PA that was working was working overnight. He wasn't really familiar with the drug. He's a surgery guy, right? So he doesn't deal with a lot of like endocrine issues. Um, and he saw the patient was on this med. The parents wanted to give it. They said, okay, so let me go ahead and reorder it. So the IV dose popped up. Now, what should you do if you're not familiar with drugs? look stuff up, right? Had he looked the stuff up and not said, okay, well, it should be fine. I'm just going to go ahead and do the same dose he was on at home. Um, the bioavailability was very, very different. The IV dose was much, much smaller than what the, this might be like a three to one ratio or something, right? Than what the oral dose was. So when you order that same IV dose, guess what happened? The patient had an overdose essentially and had toxicity from that. Calcium levels ended up dropping, had to replace that. Again, these are issues you run into, right? The system's only as smart as we make it, yeah. So he may have seen a, a thing that said, hey, are you sure you want this dose? He said, yeah, sure. That's good. You ever heard of alert fatigue? That is a very real thing you're going to run into, right? When you're dealing with electronic medical record systems, you're going to get alerted for everything. I get alerted for pregnancy warnings for every single female patient nine years of age and older. Do I really think that many nine or ten-year-olds are going to get pregnant in, at the hospital? I hope not. doesn't mean it can't happen, but I hope not. But I see those alerts every single time. After a while, you get sort of jaded to those. You get sort of like, I'm just going to click through it, just click through it. Be careful with that stuff, right? So he may have seen a warning, but maybe just said, that's probably fine. And remember that Swiss cheese model I mentioned? This was overnight. It was probably 2 or 3 a.m. in the morning. We got one pharmacist working the whole hospital. He made the order. That was the first hole of the Swiss cheese that lined up. The pharmacist said, okay, probably looks okay. He must know what he's doing. That was the second hole. And guess what? The nurse didn't catch it because it was an unfamiliar med to her. Said, okay, must be good. Gave it. Boom. Swiss cheese lines up, right? You got to be careful with this stuff. Anyway, back to my point, talking about bioavailability, because, again, I'm very easy to get off on, on the tangents, which is poor uh, of my uh, judgment because I've got so much to get through. Anyway, so propranolol, 25% of it actually is going to make it through into that systemic circulation, right? So be careful of the IV to PO doses there. A lot of drugs are one-to-one. -one, you don't have to worry about it. This is not one of those situations. So let's say the half-life of propranolol is approximately six hours, okay? So that means that hour zero, once that drug gets absorbed, Let's say it gets absorbed very quickly. What should be the amount of drugs circulating in the body? 40 milligrams, right? It's only 25% of that original 160 we put into the system, right? Okay, well, based off of that half-life, what should be the concentration, say, six hours later? Only 20, right? Another half-life later? 10, and 5, and 2.5, and, and then until eventually where you just can't measure it anymore, right? You have undetectable concentrations. So, again, we know half-life just means the time it takes to get half of that drug eliminated, okay? So... Also looking then at the distribution, right? So where does propranolol actually go? We mentioned it's hydrophilic or lipophilic? It's very lipophilic, right? So one of the other big factors about distribution is whether or not it's bound to the serum proteins, right? Remember, if it's bound to a serum protein, is it able to go out into the tissues? 
No, it's being sequestered there on those proteins. So we mentioned what's a, what's a, um, an important serum protein that a lot of drugs bind to. Albumin's a big one. This is an example of another one called alpha-1 acid glycoprotein. Propranolol is about 90% bound to, the, to that protein in the circulation there, and that affects the volume of distribution, okay? That means that 90% of it is bound, which means 90% of it is being held in that central circulation, whereas the other 10% is able to get out into the tissues, right? So and that means that 10% of that 40 is just 4 milligrams that is available to go out, interact with the heart, interact with the brain, wherever it's going to be working at, right? What would happen if I were to say decrease the concentration of alpha-1 acid glycoprotein in that patient? A fraction of the free drug would go up, right? So say it maybe goes from 10% to 20%. So what does that mean for my efficacy of the drug? It's going to work better, right? Because I got more free drug, but what does that also mean? More toxicity, right? Because again, now I could potentially alter my dosage to account for that, right? And we do that sometimes. Certain drugs, if I know a patient has hypoalbuminemia, I can adjust the dose to account for that, right? Or I'll check levels and I can look for that sort of thing there. Um, but again, these are the things you have to consider, right? Are there altered protein concentrations that affect distribution? This is, could be one of those examples there, right? So let's say that we have a 70 kilogram typical male patient and we're going to administer 160 milligrams PO. Again, we know that that amount that actually made it to the circulation is 40 milligrams, okay? And then we drew a blood level on that patient, and we got the concentration of 0.14 milligrams per liter, okay? So based off of that, what's the volume of distribution for propranolol in that patient? And we can figure that out, right? Remember that we have our uh, equation here that's going to be able to, to help us out with that. Remember, C0 is what? Concentration. Initial concentration equals the dose in milligrams over the volume of distribution in liters, now remember, you don't need to do calculus to get this stuff figured out. It's just simple algebra. So we solve for the volume of distribution, right? So we flip those around, and now we have volume of distribution in liters is equal to dose over C0, right? So in this case, what would be the dose that I would put into this equation? Put that 40, right? And then the C0 would be what? That's 0 0.14. Okay, so what do you get? Hmm? 285? So it would be 285 what? Liters, right? So again, your answer would end up being in liters based off of that, okay? So again, just to kind of put it into to textual formats here, again, this is how we're solving this. By putting it 40 milligrams over that 0.14, you get a volume distribution of four, I'm sorry, uh, 286 liters, right? Now that's for that patient, right? How could I take this information and then apply it to someone else? Well, I take that patient's weight out of the equation, and so I would take that 286, uh, 286 and divide it by the weight of the patient, which is? 70 kilograms, and I end up getting 4 liters per kilogram. Hmm? 100%, right? So if I have a patient who weighs only 50 kilograms and I give them the same dose and presume they have the same volume distribution, I'd have a different concentration, right? This is why we do weight-based dosing for certain things to make sure that we don't we take into account how their weight has, has changed that concentration, right? So that 4 liters per kilogram, does that mean that's a high or a low volume distribution? Hi, wait, what was the cutoff? One, right? So one liter per kilogram. So that means, and what, what do we say? We said that propranolol is, is highly lipophilic. Does that jive with the volume distribution of four liters per kilo? Yeah. It does, right? Because that means it is lipophilic. It likes to partition out to that tissue. Whatever is free, it does. Uh, and then it can go out there and do its thing. This is really important because propranolol is able to partition to the CNS very well, right? So propranolol is sometimes used for state fright, right? For, for performance anxiety. It helps to deal with a lot of that sympathetic sort of outflow that you feel if I were to say call on you and come up and say, hey, give a dissertation on aspirin elimination, you probably feel pretty heart racing, sweating a little bit, right? Propranolol can help to block some of that, right? And part of it is because it gets into the CNS and can deal with some of that. The other thing is, is elderly patients, if you give this to them, they tend to develop nightmares because it's going to cross over the CNS, can cause nightmares, can cause worsened dementia. This is why certain drugs are very, you have to be very careful when you give it to elderly patients, right? So again, these are features that we consider when looking at these different drugs here. So let's say, for instance, that we wanted to figure out what would be the plasma concentration if I were to apply this information to, say, a 50 kilogram female, okay? So we're going to administer a dose of 120 milligrams, and then we're going to have this volume distribution of approximately four liters per kilogram. What concentration would I get for that patient? Again, we're using the same equation here. C0 equals dose over VD. How would I figure out my VD? Hmm? Well, let's say, no, I, I want to figure out what this patient's specific volume distribution is based off the knowledge I have now. 
you apply the weight, right? So I take that four liters per kilogram, I multiply by the patient's weight, which is 50. What do you get? 200, right? So you get 50 times four, and that way you have that specific patient's volume distribution, right? So now I know that this number is going to be 200 here, right? My dose, what would the dose be? Would it be 120 or would it be something else? Remember our, our bioavailability. It would be a quarter of 120, which is 30. So now I have 30 milligrams over 200 liters. What do I get? Did I put it on the next slide? I did. Thank goodness. Otherwise, I'm going to bust out my calculator and have to do it. So anyway, so you'd end up getting 30 milligrams over that 4 liters times 50, or 30 over 200. She would get an approximate serum concentration of 0.15 milligrams per liter. Pretty similar to what that other patient got, right? He got 160 milligrams, it got 0.14. This patient got 120, got 0.15. Remember, we reduced the dose because we had a smaller patient we were dealing with and got roughly the same serum concentrations. Because again, the only thing that we changed was the dose. The volume distribution stayed the same between the patients there, right? It just depending on what the size of the patient was in the first place. Now, do you think we do this clinically very often? Sometimes we do, quite frequently, right? So and there are certain drugs that we are shooting for certain concentrations. Remember, it has a narrow therapeutic index. There's generally a small window that I'm shooting for to get, make sure I'm getting efficacy without developing toxicity, right? So a lot of antibiotics we'll do this for, for patients who are coming into the hospital. Um, and so we want to make sure that we're giving them an appropriate dose right off the bat, right? We don't want to have to just give a random dose to a patient and then get a level back and say, well, oh, that was too high or that was too low. We can proactively determine what's an appropriate dose of that patient based off of things like knowing the drug's volume distribution, knowing what the weight of the patient is, knowing these different factors. So that means that if I had a 50 kilogram patient or if I had, say, a 60 kilogram patient or anything, knowing that if I was, if I was shooting for that concentration, I could figure out what dose I would need to do that, right? So again, it's being proactive to try to hopefully get to efficacy right off the bat and avoid that toxicity there. So again, that's an example of how we'd apply that actually clinically, okay? So let's say we have a new drug. It's called Sarcastanol so in order to treat excessive sarcasm. No, no one here has that problem, right? And we have a weak, it's a weak acid, right? It's a pKa of 5.4, has a bioavailability of roughly 90%, meaning 90% of that drug is going to get through with an oral dose, and has a volume distribution of 0.2 liters per kilogram. Now, based off of that, is a, is a high or low volume distribution? It's low, right? Because it's less than one liter per kilogram. So you think it's very lipophilic or very hydrophilic? Tends to be more hydrophilic, right? So, because again, it doesn't like to partition out too far. And we're going to be dosing it at uh, 500 milligrams every six hours. Okay, those are kind of the basics uh, there. After 500 milligram dose, how much actually gets into the systemic circulation? 90% of 500, which is 450 milligrams, right? So that 450 is what's actually circulating there in the blood now. Okay. What happened? What would happen if I were to give, say, Tums to that patient? Tums is normally used for what? Yeah, for acid reflux, right? You give it for GERD symptoms, right? So um, it's an antacid. I mean, it's going to neutralize acids. What do you think it does to the pH? should increase it, right? It's calcium carbonate, right? It's a base. So it's going to be increasing the pH there. So based off of what we know of the pKa of the drug, so it's a weak acid, what is that going to do to the absorption? It would have more of it being in a charged state, right? Because it's going to be a weak acid in a more basic medium. It's going to have a harder time absorbing. My bioavailability would go down, right? Less absorption. And again, this is something you can see that where by giving something like uh, drugs for GERD that affects the pH, you can affect drug absorption pretty significantly. So that would be an example of how that would work. It caused my bioavailability to go down. The drug would be theoretically less effective, right? Because less of it's actually getting into the circulation. Okay. What would be an expected serum concentration if I were to give a 500 milligram oral dose to a 70 kilogram male? So we said our dose that we're going to plug in here would be what? 450, right, because we're assuming that 90% bioavailability, and we said it's going to have a VD of what? Let's say 0.2. Yeah, so 0.2 liters per kilogram, so that's that 0.2 times 70, because that's the weight of the patient, so I get a specific volume of distribution for that patient of? Yeah. 14 liters, right? 0.2 times 70. It's going to be, and again, this is harder math than I would ever have you do on the test, right? So don't don't fret too much. Keep the relationships in mind. That's the biggest thing here, right? So let's say we have 0.2 times 70 is 14 liters. So I got 450 milligrams as my dose. My volume distribution is 14 liters. What is the serum concentration I would expect? 
32 milligrams per liter, right? Keep your unit straight. You can really get yourself into trouble if you screw that up. So as an example, I'll go back to aspirin again. Uh, a therapeutic aspirin level is between, say, 15 to 30 micrograms per ml. I'm sorry, milligrams per deciliter. I'll say milligrams per deciliter, 15 to 30. Um, I one time had a, uh, a hospital call me up and said, oh, my gosh, the patient's level is 400. And I said, oh, no, that patient's probably dead. Like, there's no way someone can have an aspirin level 400 and be, be, it's not compatible with life, right? I said, wait a sec, how's the patient doing? They're like, patient's fine. I said, okay, well, something's going on here, right? But I said, what was the units that you were measuring that in? Well, they had it in micrograms per ml. I did the conversion, and actually it was only 40. So she was high, but not 400 level high, where I would be like, oh, boy, the patient's going to be dead soon, right? Um, so, again, this matters, right? So keep your units straight because you look at it, and you're like, okay, well, it may be high, maybe low, but may not be this thing. You may be comparing apples to oranges there, right? Okay, and again, notice how this concentration is, we got what? What's the concentration? We said 32 milligrams per, per liter. How does that compare to the kind of concentrations we are getting with propranolol? It's a lot higher, right? Because remember, we said this is a much more hydrophilic drug, has a lower volume distribution. Why, is those, why are those concentrations higher? Well, because more of it's in the serum we're actually measuring, right? With propranolol, so far distributed, you weren't even able to detect it because a lot of it was out of the serum, right? With me so far. So those are kind of the concepts. This is how this stuff kind of applies in real life there. Okay. Any questions on that? Again, you can work through the math. We'll do a lot more math when we get to things like drug dosing, especially for pediatrics. So also keep in mind that you will have to do some math for the test, um, but it's going to be stuff that will be, I'll let you have a calculator. It will be relatively straightforward, as we'll see. Anyway, so going to the next section, let's see. I apologize for not giving you a break, but again, we lost... About 50 minutes there, so if you need to go to the bathroom, feel free to go ahead. Um, let's get into neonatal and geriatric pharmacology. Why do we care about geriatric and neonatal patients so much? They're special, right? They're they're just they're so different than your adults. No, um, because in extremes of age, you tend to find that drug handling gets uh, very wacky, right? You're going to find changes greatly between what a normal, healthy adult patient would do versus what people in extremes of age would end up doing here, right? So we're going to kind of cover those features there. Um, with geriatrics, you know, we'll kind of address geriatrics every time we talk about a drug because who are most of your patients? What kind of patients are you mostly giving drugs to? Mostly older patients, right? So, again, we're talking about that a lot of the time. Um, we'll talk about pediatrics more specifically in uh, Farm 1 or Farm 2. I can't remember where it, where it falls. Um, we'll talk about that, that population a little bit more specifically. But in general, when we get into Farm 1, we're talking about healthy adults and geriatric patients a lot of the time. So I'll make those special mentions there. Anyway, what do we consider to be geriatric? Greater than 65, typically, right? So my, my parents would probably be very upset at that definition, but it is what it is. Sorry, parents. You're geriatric now, I hate to tell you. Um, we know that we're having an increasing older population. As medical care gets better, people are living longer, which means you're going to have more people on more medications, right? Polypharmacy. When I say polypharmacy, what does that mean? Multiple, multiple medications is growing. You're going to find that because, you know, do people just see one provider as they get older? No, they got their rheumatologist, they got their cardiologist, they got their allergy specialist, they got a ton of different providers here. Everyone's providing different medications, and a lot of times, no one's communicating with one another. You might be that central person who is kind of the nerve center of all of that because you're handling, say, their primary care. You need to be a good steward of that and make sure you're looking at it like, hey, does this make sense we're combining all these different medications when no one's really talking to each other? Because I will tell you what normally happens is, um, you know, if you're, you're the primary care provider and you see all these different meds are interacting, all these different issues there, um, are you going to feel confident to say, like, well, I'm going to go ahead and stop this medication? No, right? It's, it's bad decorum, right? It's bad decorum to go and interfere with someone else's orders like that. Um, what can you do, though? Call them, right? Just call them, have a conversation. Hey, I notice this patient is on this drug and this drug. They're interacting together, and they're having this sort of side effect. What do you want to do about that, right? Have those con kind of collaborative conversations there. I will tell you, though, that because you're busy, you're seeing a lot of patients, those phone calls frequently do not happen, and patients will be kept on, uh, you know, sort of nonsensical medication regimens for years and years and years, um, and no one ever really goes and touches them. So again, are you going to be those kind of PAs? No, you're going to make that phone call. You're going to change the world. You're going to do everything right all the time, right? Of course you will. Anyway, so getting into it, um, with geriatrics, it's really important to do assessments of their function, right? To determine what are they able to do, what can they not do, um, based on their disease states, based on a lot of different features there. So for instance, you have a patient who is um, on, say, six or seven different medications, and their eyesight is starting to fail. Could that be a problem? Yeah, right. They can't even read the medication labels. Very small print. They may get their drugs mixed up. 
I had this one old lady who's coming in. This is like my community rotation when I was in school. And she was on like 12 or 13 different medications there. And she was coming in for refills on them all. So I go and refill them on. I was like, you know, I could look at her and you could just tell she had these really horrible cataracts and she couldn't see not six inches ahead in front of her. And I said, well, how do you keep all these medications straight? How do you do that? And I noticed that on her pill bottles, she had these very large symbols written on the top. So she'd have like an orange diamond on one of them and then like say a, a red triangle on another one. And I was like, do you keep it like you keep it all memorized just based off of that? She's like, yeah. And I was like, there's no way you got all that memorized. Like, you, there's got to be, there's got to be something, some fault in your system. And she's like, test me. And I went through every single one of them, and she knew every single one of those medications. There, she's like, oh, that one I take twice a day. This one I'm going to take just with food. This one, she had it all down, right? So her mental faculty is quite sharp. Physical faculties are starting to fail her, right? Her senses are starting to fail. So again, you're going to find patients in extremes of, of either of those. Um, sometimes their mental capacity is not such that they can even remember to take any medications, right? So it's going to be very dependent there. And this is where we like to uh, look at the function uh, functionality of the patient. And again, this is where interdisciplinary care is super important, right? So looking at the dietitians, looking at the respiratory therapists, your uh, other specialists, you know, your pharmacists, you know, everyone else has to have uh, input in order to get the full kind of picture on the patient there. Because again, we're talking about things like basic activities of daily living. What are those sorts of things? Get up, brush your teeth, go to the bathroom, things like that. More intermediate things are like, can you do like home repairs? Can you cook yourself some food? You know, things like that. And then we obviously we have like the advanced uh, activities of daily living. Are they getting out there on their golf cart, going out, hitting them, hitting around a golf? You know, things like that, right? So kind of looking at, see where they're at. You have patients that are not able to perform any of these, and that can be very difficult if they don't have a lot of home support in terms of healthcare providers or family and things like that. So um, looking at the nutrition section first, like why do elderly patients have poor nutrition in some cases? They might not have money to afford, you know, a nice varied diet, you know, maybe their taste buds are going, they really just like, like a lot of salty food, right? And that's affecting maybe their hypertension. Um, you're going to find, and I apologize, the picture is kind of screwing things up. But even things like constipation is a pretty frequent thing you're going to find elderly patients. And guess what a lot of medications induce? Constipation, right? Not only that, you tell me, oh, you gotta drink a lot of milk because you want your calcium so you don't get osteoporosis. What does that do to your GI tract? Stops it up, right? So you're gonna find there's a lot of things that can interact here. And again, if they're feeling full and they're having abdominal discomfort from the constipation, maybe they don't want to eat. Maybe they don't want to take their medications. Maybe that leads to nausea, vomiting, etc. Um, so again, there's a lot of different things that can factor into this. Why do we care about a patient's nutrition status when it comes to drugs? alters a lot of things, right? So again, what kind of foods they're eating can interact with our drugs. Um, looking at things like uh, if they don't have good protein sources, you know, if that, their albumin levels are low because they're malnourished, they may not be able to distribute drugs effectively or like we would expect them to. It comes into a number of different features here, which we'll cover. But you want them to ask things like, okay, what kind of foods, what kind of drinks, what kind of intake have you had over the past 24 hours to get a general sense of kind of what they're doing there. Um, so in, in drinks, why, is, why are drinks important? Are they getting dehydrated because they're not drinking enough water? Are they having a ton of caffeine intake? Are they, you know, drinking things that maybe um, are interacting with some of their medications potentially? You know, what kind of milk intake do they have? There's a lot of different questions you're going to ask about. Um, and again, typically try to get a general feel for what their, their intake is. Um, I remember when I was doing my uh, my rotations, I did a Coumadin clinic, a Warfarin clinic. One of the big things you have to monitor for is their diet because uh, they get too much vitamin K in their diet. Anyone know where you find a lot of vitamin K in food? Kale, green leafy vegetables is kind of the general umbrella. Um, so, you know, you're going to find that uh, patients have a lot of vitamin K intake. Their warfarin doesn't work as well. You have to give them a higher dose. If they have very little intake, warfarin works too well, and you got to reduce their dose. Now, this is in Palaka, Florida. Anyone familiar with Palaka, Florida? Well, at least one person's heard of it, right? So, again, that tells you. So, if you look at Gainesville on the map, you look at St. Augustine, it's kind of in between. It's kind of the kind of the swamp hole right in the middle there. Um and I'm not even from Palak. I'm from even smaller town outside of that. So I'll just show you. Um, we can all come from humble beginnings, as it turns out. Um, but these are a lot of these people were kind of kind of salt of the earth kind of people. They're like a lot of times they were growing their own food, and that was their main source of, of intake, right? So I'd have these people who are eating um, nothing but kale and spinach and collard greens and all these different things. They're just like that's just a staple of their diet, and we had to take that into account when dosing their warfarin. So these people, on average, want a lot, much higher dose of warfarin than it would be if I went to, say, somewhere where they weren't doing that, right? So these are things you have to take into consideration. A lot of it tends to be more drug, uh, more drug specific, but you have to ask the questions, right, to figure out, are they getting the intake like they should? Um, looking at things like, you know, alcohol intake, right? So you ask a patient, how much alcohol do you drink? 
are they always forthright with you? Yeah, so a general rule of thumb I've always heard, uh, maybe this is a little cynical, but it says, you know, always double whatever they, they say their alcohol intake is and always half what they say their methadone dose is. People tend to not be truthful about some of that stuff. Um, but yeah, I think about, you know, drinks of beer, liquor, or wine they're getting in daily. And I said, okay, well, how many drinks do you have, say, a day? And I say, oh, I have one drink of wine. I said, well, how big is that drink of wine? They said, it's a whole bottle, <laughs> right? Asking about sizes can be important, right? So how much actual in alcohol intake are they getting? Um, you know, looking at things like, you know, any kind of dentition issues, any kind of oral health issues, it could be uh, problematic there. You know, asking about, do they have money to even buy food? You know, do they have assistance programs that are helping them out with that? Um, other big things we can do is tracking their weight gain or loss over time, right? To see if they're getting too much, too little, et cetera. Um, and again, also asking about things like, you know, prescription or OTC meds and looking for interactions that could be coming up due to diet. Now, laboratory assessment, you guys haven't had a lot of um, uh, education on like laboratory assessments yet, right? You're going to get into it, and I'll kind of mention some of the things that you at least kind of have them stick out in your mind now, so when you encounter them later, it should make more sense. Um, typically, when you're evaluating a patient in terms of laboratory values, when it comes to medications, here's some of the common things you're going to be getting. So when I say a CMP, anyone know what that means? Yeah, so, or a complete metabolic panel or a comprehensive metabolic panel. These are good because they give you uh, your electrolytes. They'll give you things like blood sugar. They'll give you things like renal function, right? How do we determine renal function off of a lab? What do we say? Serum. Yeah, serum creatinine is helpful. BUN is also helpful, right? Don't ever say bun. People will laugh you out of the unit. Say BUN, right? Um, they you a lot of helpful information, right? You know, again, if they have poor renal function, you'll tend to find their electrolytes tend to be off a lot of times. Their potassium might be too high, et cetera. Um, but you also, with the complete metabolic panel, will end up getting uh, liver function as well, right? So you can look at things like total protein. You can look at things like their ALT, AST, to determine how their uh, liver is functioning. Now, if I say a basic metabolic panel, does anyone know what that includes? Another name for that is Chem7. So chemistry 7, so it has seven things on it, right? So basically, you have your sodium, you have your chloride. Again, this won't be on the test specific. I'm just kind of to let you know, give you a heads up. So sodium chloride is going to have your potassium. It's going to have your bicarb. Why do I care about bicarb? Acid base status. Yeah, definitely. It's going to tell me if my, is my patient acidotic or not, essentially. Uh, BUN, creatinine, and then finally glucose on there. That's the, that's the Chem 7 makeup. You'll see those little fish bones, and that you'll be able to fill that out eventually. Um, so when you get a CMP, it has a much more comprehensive, so it includes a lot more stuff like liver function and other electrolytes, magnesium, phosphate, et cetera. Um, so those are useful information to have. Yes, sir? Um, serum creatinine and then glucose is a seven, yeah. So anyway, so other things we can look at, things like serum cholesterol and their lipid panels, right? What is, why do we care about this for our patients? Cardiovascular risk, right, you know, looking at they have high serum lipids, you know, there could be a risk for cardiovascular disease down the road, things like that. Um, A1C, anyone know what that is? Diabetes. Yeah, it helps us out with diabetes, right? So it's uh, uh, glycosylated hemoglobin A1C. What does that tell us, essentially? Yeah, it's average glucose levels over the past three months or so. It's usually a percentage. You know, usually you're looking to get, like, patients below, say, 7% or so, and that equates to roughly having a normal serum glucose, uh, blood glucose. Um, you know, this is good because someone can, you know, not be taking their diabetes medications, and then they're coming in to see you. They know they're getting labs done, so they'll go ahead and take it that day, get their glucose under control, or take their insulin, get it under control, but then you check their A1C and see it's, like, 8 or 9%, and you're like, okay, well, obviously you're not being compliant the rest of the time you are today. Right, so little things you can kind of pick up on to determine how patients are being compliant with your stuff. Um, CBCs are useful. You can look at things like hemoglobin, hematocrit. A lot of these patients don't have either sufficient iron absorption or they have poor iron intake, which leads them to have less hemoglobin. Why do we care about hemoglobin? If you don't have it, you can't deliver oxygen effectively. You get fatigued. You're just laying around. You're tired all the time, et cetera, right? Um, B12 levels are really important in, that, in terms of that as well to stave off some anemias. And then also your analysis can be sometimes useful for um, looking at things like, you know, are they losing protein? Are they losing glucose? Um, different things like that. These are the things we consider when we're looking at drug therapy and seeing, like, okay, are things working like they're supposed to? Are there things we need to adjust doses, et cetera, right? So... Um, and again, polypharmacy is a result of people living longer. We're having more chronic diseases. Um, you know, even certain disease states where people were dying much earlier. So, for instance, HIV is a big one, right? Because again, people when you got HIV back in the 80s, it was essentially a death sentence. Now we have people living a lot longer because medical therapy is a lot better. Now they're developing a lot of other 
disease states, right? Now they're developing heart disease. Now they're developing hypertension, hyperlipidemia, et cetera, because they're living longer, right? And then even looking at uh, evidence-based guidelines, like, okay, well, the guidelines say I have to use these three drugs for this patient, and then this other guideline says I have to use these three drugs, then i got to use six drugs, right? So, again, evidence-based medicine can sometimes increase the number of meds you're using there. So, as I mentioned, um, looking at the number of meds a patient might be developing, right? So, if you have osteoporosis, osteoarthritis, type 2 diabetes, hypertension, and COPD, which, again, is not that uncommon to run into a patient like that, they could be on 12 different medications. They're taking five different times a day. What do you think compliance would be with that? Pretty poor, right? Even if you tried your best, like, it would be pretty poor even for you to do that, right? Of course, when you ask the patient when they come in, hey, are you taking all your meds like you're supposed to? What do they say? Mm-hmm. Yep. 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 Because again, they don't want the they don't want the disapproving stare from you, right? They don't want to see. They don't want to get scolded from their provider. So um, again, that's why it's important to always maintain very kind of open, positive, non-judgmental sort of environment. So like, hey, you know, do you ever miss your medications? Like, are there any times where maybe you get confused and don't take it like you're supposed to? You know, asking questions like that can be useful. Um, also, looking at things like hospitalizations. Typically, people end up leaving the hospital on more meds than they were on when they came in. Again, you see how these start to build up over time, and if no one's actually going through and paring that list down, then it just stays on there forever. Right? It can be on meds for decades. So why do we care about this? What are the consequences of polypharmacy? You see more adverse drug reactions, right? The more meds you add on, the more likely you are to have an interaction to where it's almost inevitable that you're at least going to have one. We can see things like falls are going to be much more prevalent when you have a lot of like antihypertensives on board, diuretics, things like that. Um, you know, They stand up, they have that orthostatic hypotension, more likely to fall. When elderly patients fall, what happens? Break they break bones, and then that's significant. The worsens their morbidity and mortality, right? Um, and then, as we mentioned, decreased compliance is going to be a big one, right? We used to do these things called brown bag, uh, brown bag events in school, where basically we go to a nursing home, and we'd have all the residents come out, and they bring all their brown bags full of medications. And of course, they liked it because they got to like talk to people, you know, because a lot of them don't have family that visits them all the time. Um, but we got to go through their med list and actually go through and be like, wow, this is from the 1980s. I don't think you actually take this anymore, right? And you can go through and kind of see, like, okay, well, this one's out of date. This one interacts with this one. You give them a list of questions they can go back to their providers with and say, hey, maybe ask them about this. You know, talk to them. Hey, you're experiencing the side effect. I think it's actually because of this medication. Is being treated with this other medication, right? So you can kind of help them out uh, from that standpoint. But you're going to find a lot, a lot of issues here if you don't go through and do good, good med histories for them. So other reasons for complex uh, or decreased compliance could be, you know, just complex dosing regimens. It could be just due to the economics of things. You know, if a patient can't afford the medication, they're probably not going to pick it up, right? Or they may try to stretch it out to last longer. So if you say, hey, take this, you know, one tablet twice a day, and the prescription for the month is 60 tablets, they may say, well, I can't really afford that. Maybe I can make it stretch it out to last two months, and I'll just take it one time a day. You think they're taking it like they're supposed to. It doesn't appear to be that effective, so what do you do? Maybe increase their dose, right? And then maybe they have some income, and then they start taking it like they're supposed to, and then maybe toxicity. Who knows, right? I, that, yeah, and that gets really tough, too, because then, like, you know, yeah, okay, here's some samples, and then they run out. They don't have a script for it, you know, that, that can be really tough too, right? So a lot, a lot of issues here. Um, you know, mental decline, visual impairment, all these can be a really big deal. Um, you know, imagine if you had a patient with, say, rheumatoid arthritis and they have some, some uh, joint abnormalities in their hands and you have a medication they're supposed to be injecting with themselves. Like, it's very difficult, right? Dexterity can be a big problem for these. Um, you know, they have, they have like, a, a child-resistant containers. It's not really child resistant. They can pop those things open, no problem. What it is resistant, though, is elderly patients, right? They have a hard time getting actually able to open those up. So we have to do things like make sure they have caps that they can get open, right? And then just patient willingness to adhere to treatment, right? Like, are there any points where people are like, just screw it, I don't even want to take any medications? Yeah, you run into that quite frequently, especially towards the end of life, uh, you know? So when you get towards that palliative care, they're like, you know, do I really care? You know, I got six months to live. Do I care that my blood pressure is a little high? Probably not, right? You know, so these are questions you have to ask your patients when they get, you know, a little bit older and they get to this point where they're starting to consider these sorts of things. There, sometimes the side effects are worse than worse than whatever the actual, you know, benefits they could be getting from it, right? There's a question of would you want to increase quality of life or quantity of life? And for some people, quality of life is much more important, especially towards the, the end of life. There, and if you're looking at this, you can see. As time goes on, you know, we're mainly looking at things like life extension until eventually we get to that point where palliative treatment is really the bigger thing we're looking at, right? Making the patients comfortable 
right there towards the end and then you know then focus more on the family at, at that point there right so again this is really big my wife did uh her her specialty residency in uh, pain management right she's a pharmacist as well and she would do this a lot for these uh, she did the va in gainesville and she would see all these vets and stuff and at a certain point like you know their copd is uh, you know really bad they're not really candidates for lung transplant you know they were just like just make me comfortable right just get, make it so my lungs don't hurt and i'm not constantly starved for oxygen you know side effects be darned, right? Um, so these are questions you have to talk, you know, honestly about with your patients there, right? So um, looking in terms of the pharmacology, how things change for elderly patients, what kind of normal organ function changes should I expect in elderly patients? What do you think? Kidneys are going to start to go. Liver's going to go. Everything's going to go, right? Once I turned 30, I started noticing, I was like, man, this body really is not really doing what it's supposed to anymore. Things are just really going downhill here. So um, for you younger than 30, enjoy it while it lasts. It will, it will all end one day. Um, yeah, but looking at things like cardiac changes, right, you're going to see typically higher systolic um, arterial pressures. You're going to see things that reduce heart rate, do de decrease cardiac output. Obviously, that has a big impact on oxygen delivery, et cetera. Um, renal function typically is going to go down pretty reliably for a lot of patients. But remember, when you get more elderly, what does your muscle mass do? Tends to go down, right? So again, less muscle mass means you produce less what? Serum creatinine, right? So that could falsely alter what your creatinine clearance is. So I can sometimes see these like 90 year old grandmas who are weighing maybe like 75, 80 pounds or something in some cases, um, and their creatinine is like 0.6. And I'm like, wow, their renal function must be great. No, they just have no muscle mass to produce the creatinine, right? So again, sometimes you have to take these things into consideration, not just look at the number, but actually look at the patient as well, right? Are the creatinine levels actually adjusted for age? No, they're not. They just, you just get a value back, right? So again, if you just looked at that, you'd say, oh, well, she must have great renal function, right? Or if you had a patient with amputations or something, you're like, all right, it looks great. Not necessarily. Or if you had, like, say, a younger guy or girl that was, you know, big into bodybuilding, had a lot of muscle mass, they might have an elevated creatinine, and you're like, oh, your kidneys aren't any good really not the case right so um, a lot of factors you have to look at there's always this this mantra of treat the patient not the number right you'll probably hear that a lot when you're going through school right always correlate those numbers back to who you're actually treating and again just over time you're going to see these decreases in function this is just expected we know it's going to happen and we can adjust for these things because again you may dose a patient back here when they're 60 and everything's relatively working well but then if you don't address it when they're 70 or 80 or 90 you're going to run into problems there right so very frequently people will stay on medications for decades and never have the doses adjusted like they should right no one ever goes back and checks so other changes we can see with the um, gastrointestinal tract, typically we're not going to find too big alterations here in terms of absorption. Um, the problem, though, is a lot of interactions that you run into, right? So you see a lot more constipation, their food, their dietary intake is going to change, maybe more calcium, maybe more, you know, things like, you know, green leafy vegetables. These are all considerations you have to take into account. Um, but certainly motility can be an issue. Um, potentially the liver enzyme, uh, you know, release or pancreatic enzyme release can be a problem. Um, the biggest thing you run into from the liver standpoint is that, especially with patients who have poor cardiac output have like congestive heart failure typically they have a lot of backup of blood on the venous side that means you're delivering less blood to the liver and what do we say that does to metabolism it slows it down because if you're not delivering the drug to the liver then it's not going to get metabolized right so these are issues we, we, we look at as I mentioned, no major absorptive changes here occur within the GI tract, but mainly it's the drug interactions that you're going to run into, right? So again, are they getting fiber in their diet? Is that interacting with anything? Are they taking over-the-counter medications that may be interacting that you don't know about, right? Because again, when I ask an elderly patient, hey, what do you, what meds do you take? They may only tell me the prescription ones, right? They may not think of over-the-counter meds as being their drugs, right? There's a thing, anyone familiar with goodies powders or BC powders? It's a, it's a southern kind of thing, um, I, I tend to find. Um, a lot of people from up north uh, or out of the country don't, are not familiar with it. But basically, there's these little um, wax paper sachets, is the, is the term, um, that in, uh, have powdered aspirin in them, right? And a lot of people don't understand, or a lot of elderly patients don't know that that's aspirin. They just think, oh, I have a headache, I take a goodies powder. Why might that be a problem? Well, because if you don't know they're taking aspirin, there could be bleeding risk associated with that. Maybe they're taking too much of it because they think, oh, I also have to take a baby aspirin every day for my heart. Not realizing those two are the same drug. Um, we had one patient who, um, someone had told him, well, every time you have chest pain, go ahead and take a goodies powder. And so this guy had a lot of anginal episodes. He would just keep taking it over and over again. And so then when um, the, you know, eventually he said, wow, this chest pain is not going away. He calls 911. EMS gets there and says, hey, have you taken any aspirin today? The guy says, no. And guess what they give him? give him aspirin, right? And then he gets into the ER, and then the resident goes, hey, have you taken any aspirin today? The patient's like, no. He gets aspirin too. So now he's 
got like a level 40, 45 or something. Now we got an aspirin toxic patient on top of his chest pain that we're dealing with, right? So again, you can see how these issues come up and when the communication uh, breaks down a little bit. So. Other things, um, distribution is going to be greatly affected as patients get older. You tend to find that when they get older, they will have things like um, increased body fat percentages compared to, say, a healthier, younger, uh, younger adult patient. Um, you're typically going to find the muscle mass is going to go down, and then the body water percentage goes down as well. So what do you think this does to volume distribution, say, for lipophilic drugs? It's going to increase, right? Because, again, pound for pound, they're going to have more adipose tissue for that stuff to distribute to, right? Uh, for hydrophilic meds, what's that going to do to distribution? Right, decrease it, right? Because again, they have left body water, so more of it's going to be kind of compacted there, concentrated in the serum, right? So these are considerations we have to make. Also consider things like, you know, their their volume intake, right? You can't have patients in the nursing home who are kind of trucking along fine in terms of renal function, in terms of uh, intake, and then all of a sudden they get sick or something, or no one kind of checks in on, on them for a while, and they stop drinking, right? Why is that a problem? They get intravascularly depleted, right? They're dehydrated. That means they can't perfuse the kidneys very well, and all of a sudden the drug levels build up. And that we've seen quite a few patients coming from the nursing home end up in the ER because their levels of medication uh, spiked up because they were dehydrated, right? So again, these are issues you have to think about in terms of that. Um, also, things like serum albumin levels tend to go down. And again, this is very nutrition dependent in the long run, so that may affect drugs that are highly protein bound. May affect what percentage of that drug is actually bound there, right? Oops, wrong way. Uh, as I mentioned, protein binding, usually there's D. Oh, yes, ma'am. So, I have a question. So, when you have those high protein binding, you have less albumin, you don't get a lot of things like you see correct? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
the yeah, drug levels are going to go up, right? Because I'm holding on to more drugs, they're not being metabolized effectively, right? So again, keep these relationships in mind. So um, going from the kinetic changes to the uh, pharmacodynamic changes, right? So we think of elderly patients being more sensitive to medications, but is that really the case? Most of the time it has to do with altered pharmacokinetics, right? So again, I may give a standard adult dose to an elderly patient and they get knocked for a loop because they, they have, you know, um, maybe a drug interaction or a kinetic interaction that just made it so that more drug got to that side of action, right? That's usually the case there. However, you tend to find these elderly patients have less of a uh, homeostatic response to a lot of things. Like, so for instance, you know, um, elderly patients are able to regulate temperature as well as someone younger. Elderly patients tend to get cold or hot. They tend to get pretty, pretty cold, right? I remember that's when I knew my, pa my parents were getting old. So when I went home for uh, uh, a, uh, an event or something like that, I walked in, I'm like, why is this place so stuffy? Like, what's going on here? It's like set to like 79 or something in the house. I'm just like, oh no, this isn't going to work. I was like, oh no, my parents are getting old. They're going to die someday. <laughs> Terrible. But um, yeah, so one of those things where they just lose some of those homeostatic sort of responses there, right? So blood pressure changes, right? They're more likely to have orthostatic hypotension, right? Especially when you add on medications that can affect blood pressure or affects their volume status, things like that. Um, looking at things like, you know, their fasting blood glucose, right? Typically, glucose tends to ride higher for those elderly patients that just don't have the same sort of homeostatic um, responses there, right? They develop resistance to some of these things in, in some cases. So looking at some specific drug class examples. Now, again, I'm not going to have you memorize every single drug here, but again, these are some of the classes that you're going to run into that tend to be a little bit more dangerous with elderly, medic or elderly patients and you have to be careful of. Um, has anyone ever heard of the beers list? It's not when like, you go to the restaurant and you say, what do you have on tap? It's not that. The beers list is a list of medications. They say these are tend to be more likely to develop toxicity in elderly patients. You have to be really careful when using them in this patient set. And you can look up the list, uh, but I'm not going to go through the whole thing. Um, but consider things like sedative hypnotic agents, right? These are things like your Xanaxes. These are things like your sleep medications. Um, you tend to find that depending on the drug, the half-lives can actually be increased pretty significantly. This is either due to decreased renal elimination or decreased hepatic metabolism. So the half-lives get longer. What does that do to the duration of action of that drug? It sticks around for longer, so it's obviously working for longer, right? So what, do you, what kind of side effects would you expect to see? Increased sedation, right? When you get up to go walk to the bathroom, Middle of the night's dark, more likely to see falls, ataxia, et cetera, right? Altered mental status. Sometimes you think, man, grandpa's dementia is just getting worse. It could just be the medications that they're on, right? It could be some of these sedative hypnotic drugs. Um, things like analgesics, like opioids, right? Um, again, they could be more likely to develop some of the respiratory suppressive effects, right? So they can actually develop um, hypoxia due to this, right? They can potentially die because of this. Um, sometimes it's due to the accumulation of active metabolites. What, is that? what do I mean when I say that? So remember, just because something got metabolized in the liver does not mean it is inactive, right? Sometimes drugs will have active metabolites. Things are still working the same way as the parent compound did. So things like morphine have metabolites that still act like morphine, right? So that means that they have this buildup of them. Guess what? They're going to get increased effects, more likely to see that toxicity, right? These are things you have to consider there. Um, looking at things like antipsychotics and antidepressants, right? A lot of times behavioral health issues need to be managed in these elderly patients. Depression, anxiety, these are normal things for them to develop. Um, looking at drugs like lithium. Anyone know what we use lithium for? I don't know if I mentioned. Yeah, usually bipolar disorder is a big one. Well, this one is entirely eliminated through the kidneys, right? Lithium actually looks a lot like salt, like sodium, and they get handled exactly the same. And so if you have decreased renal function, guess what? You have decreased lithium clearance, and that can lead to some very severe toxicities because of that. Um, antidepressants, some of them can worsen mentation of the elderly patients. They can, again, you think they're having worsened dementia or Alzheimer's, could just be the medications that they're on. Sometimes we have alternatives that are safer. Like nowadays we have the SSRIs like your Prozacs and your Lexapros and things like that, but sometimes they need to be on the older school drugs and they can worsen a lot of those, these effects we're seeing. Uh, looking at cardiovascular meds, things like antihypertensives will definitely worsen the risk for orthostatic hypotension because that's what they do, right? They lower blood pressure. Um, you can see things like electrolyte imbalances with diuretics. You can see hypokalemia, hyponatremia, all kinds of things that can develop from that. Also, think about it, if you're taking a diuretic, what do you have to do more often? Go to the bathroom, right? What do you have to do that in the middle of the night? Again, risk for falls, right? So again, if they're having orthostatic hypotension, when they get up to go pee in the middle of the night and they trip over something and fall and break their femur, 
again, that is related back to the medication, right? Even though it seems unrelated, it certainly is. Um, antiarrhythmics, right? We use uh, those uh, with some regularity. Again, they have poor hemodynamic reserves. They're more likely to see things like other arrhythmias or hypotension, things like that. And again, you have to look at the organ adjustments, look at the renal function adjustments or the hepatic adjustments to make sure that they're going to get just the right amount of drug without causing too much toxicity. So again, as we know, with adverse reactions, as we have an increasing number of drugs, the risk for adverse reactions goes up exponentially. Again, by the time you're on 10 medications, it's nearly 100% likely you at least have one kind of interaction. It may not be a severe reaction, but it could be something, right? And very frequently, patients don't know what side effects are that are associated with medications. So sometimes they just think, oh, wow, this is just normal now. This is just how things are. My body's failing. But no, it could be an interaction that they're running into, an adverse drug reaction they have from one of their meds. So things to consider. And then, you know, obviously you have to factor in the OTC and the herbal meds. A lot of times, especially if you have an air of you don't think the herbals work, patients may not be likely to tell you about the herbals that they take. Okay? That can be really problematic because do herbals do anything? Do they actually work? They do. Some of them can be quite deadly, right? So as an example, I'll tell you, um, we had one lady who came in. She was um, coming in for ultra mental status, having kind of stroke-like symptoms, um, and she was on warfarin for her atrial fibrillation. She was also getting elderly, her memory starting to go. Anyone know what um, supplement you might use for, like, for memory? Use ginkgo, ginkgo biloba, right? Ginkgo actually has natural anticoagulant effects as well. So guess what? What was causing the stroke-like features? Well, she had a massive intracranial bleed. The patient died from that, right? It's one of those CT scans where even the pharmacist can look at it and be like, oh, that's not right. It certainly was not. So I had a massive head bleed because of that, right? Because of this interaction that she was not aware of, and maybe no provider would have even been able to caught it if they didn't ask the right kind of questions, okay? So little things to think about with these um, uh, OTCs and herbals, they definitely do work, right? But um, they just don't have as much regulation around them as normal prescription drugs would. Okay. And again, looking at adverse reactions, reasons for that, oftentimes prescribers are not taking age into account, right? And looking at the organ function, um, you can also have a lot of patient compliance errors or they're just seeing a lot of different providers. So again, you, assuming you're going to be that primary care person, you may not be, but assuming you are, or if you're in the ER position, you see someone coming in for possibly a drug interaction or adverse reaction, you need to be able to kind of look at that, coordinate all these different things to see, okay, what do I need to do for this patient there? As I mentioned, like the BC powders example, a lot of times they don't even know that something is a medication. So how can you go about getting a good history from these patients here? Again, it's all about the questions that you ask. Again, try to ask open-ended questions. When I say open-ended, what does that mean? It's not yes or no, right? Because I could have said, do you know what yes? Or do you know open-ended questions are? And you can say no or yes, and then that's the end of it, right? But if I say, hey, tell me what an open-ended question is, that invites a discussion, right? It invites more um, uh, more dialogue. And again, then you can finish up with more closed-ended questions, but that's a good way to start off, right? So again, how are you using the medication, right? Tell, Teach me how you're supposed to be using the medication there. It's a lot better than just say, are you taking your medication like you should? Because they're going to tell you, yes, I am, right? But again, do that teach-back method can be very useful there. Um, you know, if they're deviating, why are they? You know, is it because of cost? Is it because of interactions, uh, adverse effects? What, what could be the reason? Um, Ask about non-prescription drugs or maybe things that aren't on their med list. Why might they be taking something that's not on their med list? Well, Greta down the road had a, had pneumonia the, uh, last time. She had a bunch of antibiotics left over, so I started coming down with something, so I took some. That happens, right? People share medications, share amongst family members or neighbors, or maybe they get stuff from outside of the country. Who could say, right? These are things you want to be able to try to pick up on if you can. Are using any homeopathic products, herbal uh, supplements, vitamins, any of these things that could be possible interactions you want to try to catch if you can. Um, now, again, I could have a patient come up and they're like, say, I'm taking this homeopathic remedy. I'm taking this essential oil or I'm taking whatever. Am I going to know what that is 100% of the time? Probably not. But what I'm going to say is, oh, interesting, very good. And then I'm going to go look it up afterwards, right? About faking confidence, even if you don't know what you're talking about. Like, okay, very interesting. I'm going to go check that out and then come back. But, oh, no, don't do that anymore. It's bad. Very bad. Um, Again, talk about drugs from other family members or friends. Are they getting it, um, say, from outside of the U.S.? You know, not all sources may be exactly as reputable as other ones. You know, um, so these are things you want to consider there. Are you still taking meds that are not prescribed anymore? Sometimes patients don't get the, you know, you're, you're giving them so much education. They're being inundated with so much knowledge and information. They miss that point where you say, hey, stop taking this med. We're starting on this one instead. So sometimes they'll have those, those duplications there. And then talk about expiration dates. Now, expiration dates... Sometimes they're useful, sometimes not. Um, certain things you want to be careful of. So at least make sure they're checking the expiration dates to make sure they're not taking something that was like good back in the 80s, right? 
structures, at least, you know, within the same decade, at least. Uh, other things, you know, are you taking medications independently? Sometimes they have to have people come and help them. Um, are they using any kind of like dosage system to help them? You know, do they have syringes or anything like that they're having to use? How are they, you know, are they able to use them? Do they have the dexterity to do so? Um, things like that, all right? So again, these are questions you want to ask to make sure they're using them effectively and have them demonstrate to you how to use your inhaler to make sure they're not spraying on their neck, right? Things like that. Okay, you can just some pictures of pill minders and things like that they can use to try to help them out. I hate these things from a poison control standpoint because invariably a little kid's going to get into one of these and they'll say like, okay, well, they got into Mondays and Tuesdays. And I was like, well, what was supposed to be in there? Like, ah, I, don't, I don't know. I had them in the pill minders. I didn't have to think about it. And so I'm like, well, I have no idea what the kid got into now. So it's a problem. It's good for them, though, because it helps them to remember when to take stuff. But. So anyway, so again, a lot of obstacles, compliance, you know, cost is always a big issue there. Again, why go with a brand new NSAID for a patient? when the cheaper one would work or ibuprofen can work. Just because a rep took you out to dinner the other night and said this drug is the best doesn't mean it's going to be best for your patient. Always consider that sort of stuff. And then you can consider intelligent noncompliance. You know, are they taking things less often to save money or are they doing it because they don't like the drug? Always consider that as well. Okay. Anyway, so sorry to keep you right up to the last minute. Are there any questions I can answer on that? I know it's kind of breakneck pace, but it's the nature of the beast. Let me check the boards. There's any questions. Nope, no questions at all. I will see you guys next week.